the series Discover Placentia, where we learn more about our community and its people. Tonight we have poet Agnes Waltz reading from and talking about her work. Before I introduce Agnes, I would like to remind you that this speaker series is a cooperative effort between the Placentia Historical Society and the Placentia 350 Incorporated, a group set up to help us mark and celebrate 350 years since Placentia, or Plaisance, was made a French capital. We are taking this opportunity to also make people aware of the very diverse history of our community. In fact, in November, our two speakers will be talking directly about that history. Another way the Historical Society is seeking to remind us of more recent history is by purchasing two models built by craftsman Bernard Penny of buildings that were once in our community, the College Hospital and the railway station. One of our fundraisers to do that is the sale of tickets for a Christmas basket, and theirs will be available after the program. Most of you probably have already bought them, so you don't have to keep going. We will also have refreshments at that time. We're pleased to again be recording this event for future playing on the internet, thanks to Jason Council. You can get in information about that on Jason's website at placentiabay.ca. I assume everyone got computers these days. And now on to our main feature. Agnes Walsh was born in Placentia, just up the road from me, and has lived in Canada, in the US, Portugal, and Ireland. She has published two books of poetry, In the Old Country of My Heart, written for Tremor Theatre on the Cape Shore, um, I think I might have skipped the other one, going around with bachelors, uh, by, uh, published by Brick Books. And a collection of plays written for Tremor Theatre on the Cape Shore, Answer Me Home, Break, published by Breakwater Books. She has read her poetry and has given creative writing workshops in the US, all across Canada, in Ireland, Portugal, Iceland, and the Azores. In 2006, she was named the inaugural Poet Laureate for the city of St. John's. So it's a great pleasure for me to welcome Agnes home and invite her to now speak to us about her work and help us discover Placentia a little more. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, and thanks to the Historical Society and the 300 Year Committee, is that the title? Yeah. yeah it's, great. it's a great pleasure to um, read in one's hometown. It's also a bit scary. I think that might say it. I'll just try to look around. <laughs> <laughs> um, the last time I read in Placentia was, um, I think it was in the late 70s. Uh, Mrs. Sullivan invited me to read at the library. So I went up there and I read, and it was, it was such an interesting afternoon and evening because um, I read and I had just come back from living in Portugal for a while. And uh, so I was, I was up there in the library reading and all of a sudden, everybody in the audience was already in and all of a sudden the doors opened and about uh, 10 Portuguese fishermen came in. <laughs> they were down in Argentia and they were um, um, fishermen uh, whose families I had visited while I was in Portugal. And so they sat in the audience and they listened and it was a very, very strange afternoon and evening because there was such a people and people in Portugal. <laughs> and it wasn't very often that um, Portuguese fishing boats, I think, ever came into our gentian. I don't think, but that was, it was kind of a little freak, uh, serendipitous moment, I think. So that was in the 70s. That's the last time I read, thanks to Mrs. Sullivan. And thanks to Tom now for inviting me again. So, for inviting me, period. Um, I certainly do have poems about placentia, because I think, after all, where we grow up really does influence us. Um, some people write about the very opposite. They might write science fiction, or they might write about um, uh, foreign lands. I do write about places that I visited and uh, also about this place. So I'll start off with a poem. And um, I'm sure that uh, 
I won't even have to say people's names. There are names mentioned in here. And uh, I think just the location of things happening in the poem, if you hear a name, you'll probably identify that. But sometimes I might bring up a name. The first one is called Out of the Rustling of Tall Grass. Out of the rustling of tall grass, onto an upshoot of boulder and sparse fur, came the trampling of a gang of small boys. Armed with stick guns and swords, and armed better still with whoops and shrills, they advanced and gained on the sheep. Mrs. Green doesn't want that. She doesn't mind them chasing after the dog or the cats, but they drives the sheep nuts, she tells Mrs. King on the fence. <coughs> Because I believe we all need echoes and comforting hills and over the sides of cliffs, I walked in search of a trace or a whisper of you on the downs. I'm looking for how you lived here and played. You are more beautiful than the brightest jigsaw puzzle of Switzerland. And I have all this sunny day to fit together the pieces of love and pain that have formed the corners of your eyes and the gesture of your hand. So that's about the downs of one bird, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and in uh, this next poem, I dedicate this poem to two really good friends of mine, Jerome Cannon, who's a, a well-known boat builder, and all of his family are uh, well known for their carpentry and political skills. And uh, my very close friend who has departed, Mercedes Barry from Marishan Island, they were uh, two very close friends of mine, Jerome still is. Um, it's about growing up in Placentia. And I'm, I'm, I mentioned a witch in here, <laughs> but it's not in a derogatory sense at all. Um, and, uh, I won't tell you who she is, but I'll tell you after. <laughs> there was hopscotch on the corner of the block, hopes of spring. Young girls in bare heads with high-pitched laughter singing popular songs. Old men repairing pots, young men launching boats. Lobster season. I passed the house of childhood haunts where an old woman lived with her ragged teeth. We stood a pack of brazen girls waiting for her to smile or sneer, and then we'd run away, delighted with our group felt terror. The witch, the witch, the yellow witch. We dared her down, and now we were free for even more daring adventures. Boys, cokes, and jukebox quarters jingling in our pockets. The snack bar full of nervous, adolescent anticipation. The snack bar was buses. <laughs> <laughs> the witch was Mrs. Hatfield. Liney Hatfield, who just, she uh, continuously smoked cigarettes, the, and all the nicotine and everything used to go up into her hair, so she had kind of white, yellow hair, and she, she was the sweetest woman, but she really looked like a witch to us when we were kids, of course. We were, all, we were always looking for witches anyway, <laughs> probably, but that's... Um, that's without naming the places. That's, um, I remember um, Mr. Bossy, he was uh, fabulous because um, sometimes myself and a couple of my girlfriends, we used to uh, get the 25 cents that our mother or fathers would give us to put in the collection box, and we would go to Mass. <laughs> and sneak down to Bossy's, and we would uh, keep the money for the jukebox. <laughs> and Mr. Bossy was a Protestant. <laughs> and he used to say, come on in, you little Catholics. <laughs> I love to see this going on Sunday morning. <laughs> oh, it's really nice times. Um, this is called Night in the Ashes, which is a, uh, a phrase of my mother's. If, uh, she always would say, if she didn't sleep, if she had insomnia, I'd say to her, how are you doing Not this morning? She said, oh, I had a night in the ashes last night. It must, I think it comes from an old Irish way of not being able to sleep and sitting by the fire, um, uh, by the open hearth, and, uh, so the ashes would be.
be around you, I suppose, instead of going to bed. Maybe having worries or something like that. I'm not sure where it comes from. But she said it a lot. Underneath this blanket of snow, pressed wildflowers push the white crust. Last night in the still, I heard them turn and groan as the stars fell. Everyone rushed inside to dance to the accordion and the electric piano, except for the shell-shocked veterans who stood leaning into the aluminum siding. Tans pushed back, cigarettes sucked brown. They twitched and stuttered a history. When the council bulldozed the Quonset huts in Kelly's Alley, the youngsters waited with BB guns and forks to kill the rats. Just don't come in the place, Mom warned. The Yanks might have money, but they also had cockroaches. <laughs> I got a French fry cutter and TV rabbit ears from the shambles of Americana. We're on the same latitude as northern France. The sky dissolves like a blot of watercolor. Drops of mauve discolor my urn. Monet sunsets run into my face. Somewhere between dreams and disaster, children smoke cigarettes and pencil beers on Queen Elizabeth. Pigeons gnaw Mary Brown's chicken bones, and yet another person crucifies St. Anne's reel on the fiddle. I douse the candle, turn on my left side, and finally yawn. I'll read you a, um, a poem now that's uh, well, not quite a poem, because poems kind of look like this on the page. <laughs> There's always poems that go down. I don't need to explain this to you, but I just wanted to show you a, um, something that I made into a poem. And the editor of this book said, I think that would be better as a prose poem. I didn't really know what a prose poem was, but... Uh, it looks like that. <laughs> it's uh, kind of you know, crowded, uh, but it has to be short and it has to be poetic, uh, I suppose. Maybe you'll judge by the successful. This um, piece came from uh, I was living with my mother. Uh, my father got really ill and he was dying, and so I. I um, I had lived in the United States for 10 years, and I came back to Placentia and went into St. John's to go to finish up my university. That's what I thought I was going to do. And um, uh, so I was going to Memorial, and my father got really sick. So I came out and helped my mother take care of my father. Uh, I didn't really have to help her, because she I think she just wanted company. But what I did was I took a lot of books from the library and just read an awful lot of um, an awful lot of novels and poetry and plays and that. And at this time, I was reading this South American writer who uh, is still alive, still writing. He's won the Nobel Prize for Literature, I think, twice. No, he only won that once. He's, yeah, he won that once. Uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And he's a kind of a surrealistic um, uh, writer who. who well, he just talks about temperate, very hot places, so that makes it surreal to me. But uh, I was really fascinated with the way that he wove a world together. So I, um, this, this piece is based partly on fact and partly on uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's writing. I don't like to explain away my work, but I just wanted to let you know that. It's called Our Border Alfred. He must have been 300 pounds. Our kitchen table sits three comfortably. When Alfred arrived with his heavy brown suitcase, our kitchen bulged and moaned and seemed to try to move over to make room. Our table dropped its lower lip and sighed. We were expecting grave discomforts and had second thoughts. Alfred worked days and returned at 4.45. He rolled his sleeves up to his elbows and carefully washed his face and forearms. After, as he buttoned his cuffs, he hummed and smiled at his good fortune, whatever it was. Then he turned and entered our kitchen like a whale in a rain puddle. We talked.
talked about this when Alfred wasn't around and decided it wasn't because he was so big, but because we were so short and women and the kitchen so small. We just weren't used to him, so silent and a man. His voice was tiny. We had to keep saying, pardon me, Alfred? What was that? And he'd smile at the most tedious questions, like a tired lion who loved little mice. One day our back door blew off, and Alfred went to his brown suitcase and got his hammer and nails, although we had our own. When he had it fixed, he took, to our double surprise, a dented four-stop accordion out of the same suitcase. He lifted up a kitchen chair with one hand, and with his accordion in the other, he went out onto the back doorstep. The instrument wheezed and squealed. Alfred went into a trance. We stood in the porch and looked at each other and at Alfred's big arms moving in and out. When he finished, he looked up and grinned. I'm rusty, he said, and it's the first time in ages I've played for the public. When the train school was built, Albert, uh, Alfred gave us his notice. He smiled and said, now I have to leave you soon, ladies, for my next job. But we didn't know how to take that. We had to pinch ourselves. We tried to be more generous with the jam. We made wider pancakes. We put less milk in the mashed potatoes. But Alfred zipped up his brown suitcase one evening and patted it on the side. Out of his windbreaker pocket, he produced a bottle of Captain Morgan and smiled as he put it on the table. We got down glasses and boiled water. Then Alfred talked. The walls expanded, puffed out, and then breathed in when he raised his glass to his lips. We were glad that no matter how far the rum went down in the bottle, he never talked dirty. We were nervous because we never drank much and we always went to Mass on Sunday. We said, Alfred, stay the night. The roads are bad. But he smiled, floated his glass under the table, got up and shook our hands. We watched through the front window as he opened the taxi door. The snow tried to bury his bulk. It's no night for traveling, we thought, and waved through the glass. Inside our kitchen, we cleaned up and sat down to look at each other. The walls moved in. The ceiling settled its shoulders on our heads. The table shrank to a miniature nightstand. Why didn't everything expand? We wondered what to do with all the space that we could now hold in our cupped hands. When we went to the door to lock up, Alfred was still struggling to get into the car. It's a little bit surreal, I guess. Mm -hmm. but it, um, the thing I was happy about with, after I wrote it, I thought, it feels like I'm, I've suspended time a bit. You know, all we'll that slow motion going on. Partly fact and partly fiction. I'll read the um, title poem from the book, In the Old Country of My Heart. It pretty much, much explains how I fell in love with words and poetry. No, nothing came easy then, except there was a blind belief, a shimmering light keeping me breathless, a sense of the world quivering in my hands. Looking up, up past the tall yellow grass, my heart flying, leaning, aching, wanting that other world where words entranced me. They'd be my wings, if only I knew. The taste of salt was a word. I licked it, named it, rolled it over, loved it. Then, wind. Then my ocean, my sky. I spoke the world for myself, my secret. If you love words, <laughs> I guess they either affect you or they don't. <clears throat> I have a big
connection to the Cape Shore. I think it was because I went out uh, with my mother, and this is Muriel Palfrey, and this is Gladys Palfrey, and who else was there? A bunch. Anyway, I went to these two up berry picking. And funnily enough, they stayed at, uh, uh, well, they would drop into Mr. Dinny McGrath's house, and I now live in his house since <laughs> then long ago, but um, my mother and uh, uh, my mother always remembered that house, except she thought I kind of shagged the look of it, because <laughs> I changed it around. But um, I, uh, I remember going out Mary Pickham with uh, all those women and just loving the wildness and the cliffs and the ocean out there. Some um, from living out there came a few poems about that area. This one is called Weather Moving. The day is so close, no air moves. Off in the distance, thunder rolls, rumbles towards us. I burn incense, make the air thicker, soak sound into my pores. I drive a nail smack into gray wood, hoping, <coughs> nodding, agreeing with myself that things look good. Every day, the sky becomes more my companion, more what I like to live under. Every night, the sound of cars climbing the Cape Shore Road reminds me of the stillness, my aloneness, and time passing. I could not have dreamed this better when, as a young girl, I lay in the tall grass, one leg raised, more coating the sun, hoping that solitude would be a friend beckoning with open arms. And there's a community on the Cape Shore called Angel's Cove, which used to be called Angel's Cove. I was told it was called Angel's Cove because it uh, had to do with how boats had an angle to get into the cove. So I said it was changed from, from that to Angel's Cove. Maybe afterwards some angels fell. <laughs> After they couldn't get in my boat anymore. <laughs> a cove nearly abandoned. Well, this is the old angels' cove, by the way. Um, there's the angels' cove on the left side of the highway going out, and then there's the old angels' cove on the, uh, near the ocean. A cove nearly abandoned. But there's hay haymakers cutting, arching into the wind and sky. The hills roll down, down onto black rocks that stop the city. The waves swell up, they leap like geysers, liquid fireworks. We're expecting a full moon any minute. I lie down on the soft, worn rock, let the water push over me feel love moving around the beach. He, standing on the highest rock, throwing up his arms into the fury. She, bending forward, gathering fuel, heaping bleached timber, eyeing the sky. The hills never move. The grass stands straight for the sire's swoosh. My body shifts to fit the rounded places in the rock. I press my cheek into the smooth hardness, feel the world through the rock, feel love circling me, the centuries under me. There's such a sense of um, ancestral history, I think, on the Cape Shore, you know, because the speech is, uh, the dialect is so live out there still. Um, I'll switch around a little bit now. I read a poem I haven't read in a while. Um, I'm sure everybody here knows who Bernice Morgan is. Random passage and, and tons of great writing after that book. When I read Random Passage and Waiting for Time and The Topography of Love, but especially when I read Random Passage, I thought, oh my gosh, even though she wasn't from Saint Gervais, writing about Saint Gervais, I thought, how wonderful that. Um, Somebody wrote a novel that went back and explained things, showed us who we are as people. Because I hadn't, I mean, I remember growing up thinking that we either had to be British or American to write 
because I thought there's no one with a limb right here. Sure. I mean, I hadn't heard. We didn't study E.J. Pratt, and we didn't study, uh, well, there wasn't very many. I mean, Margaret Dewey, we didn't study her, although they were all writing and publishing. But um, there's been such a big renaissance in the past, since the 1970s. Well, really, even the 60s, because Breakwater Books started in the 60s, and Al Pittman published with them. Um, so many really good writers that brought Newfoundland writing to the forefront. Now, I was really fortunate to be involved in that in the mid-70s and to publish uh, poetry with Breakwater. But Bernice Morgan's writing passage really moved me. And um, it moved me for a couple of reasons, because I, she wrote about ordinary people. You know? it, it wasn't uh, the kings and the queens and what was on in the fine anyways. Uh, she, just, she wrote about the, the, the people who were trying to make a go of it way back then. You know? So this is called for, for Bernice Morgan After Reading Random Passage and Waiting for Time. <clears throat> I can't ever look at the Basilica the same way again. Now I see workers, slaves, drone for the queen bee, mother church. I see the pompous pink knuckle priest sipping port and farting fatuously. I can't look at Harbor Drive, water and Duckworth streets, paved now, finger pairs long gone, history flattened out. I can't eat a potato, a bit of fish, drink the occasional import, iron a new shirt without shaking my head at my good fortune. And sometimes I can't even write a poem without the guilt and balled up paper, my waste paper basket overflowing. In my dreams I see Tim Toop and Mary Bundle, dirty and abused, scurrying under fish flakes, darting up and down muddy 19th century streets, living on wits worth more than merchant's gold. But even now, the taste of moist blueberries, cool in my mouth, links me. And the odd turr smelling up the kitchen links me. And yes, also some uppity merchant's daughter, bragging and proud of her heritage, links me, in that it turns me, and that it reminds me of how far we still have to go. <clears throat> Um, this poem uh, was, was actually put to music by uh, the Lady Cove Choir in St. John's. Um, they uh, put two of my, they put in the old country of my heart, and this poem I'm going to read to you next to. Um, it's a it's a ladies' choir. Actually, they're quite prestigious. You probably know that they won all kinds of awards all over the world. And Kelly Walsh, who was the director of the choir also commissioned me to write a poem for the choir. And I did that, and it's called um, Lady Cove, and that, that's Cove in, uh, in Trinity Bay. Maybe it's Bob Vista Bay, I can't remember now. But uh, they put this next poem of mine to music, and it was quite thrilling to go and hear all these voices sing something that he wrote. You know? so, I didn't know for sure if I'd like it, because I'm not a big fan of choir music. I, I didn't like it well enough, but it had a, quite an emotional effect on me that they would pick this particular one. So it's called The Sky is Always Young. The sky is always young here on this edge of earth. Even its gray clouds aren't serious. They drift over, roll off like a child turning softly in her crib. Only my hands, cupped and the paint peeling from rust, show how old we all are here on this island that we dream. I know I make the ear heavy with my words, but it's a weight born in me, and it's in you too. I flick the stopwatch, am horrified at what seconds mean, the tenderness of time clicking, slipping, when I never said, never looked close enough, a problem common to dreamers the lightness of the body, the weight of the soul. And at the party, all eyes are on the song as it floats from the singer's mouth, floating out to the lights glowing in the harbor. A touch brings the world back to me, 
a welcome to concrete and clay. Inside here, where love is stored, slicked in cod liver oil, there's a moan, a long rumble without register, but I've tempered it, dampened it down, otherwise knowing my heart would attack me. So tonight, I puff the world out. I push back what wants me, but doesn't like me. And I picture you there in the meadow, needing me. And 
I, I wrote the piece in her voice, so I'm just going to go over <coughs> as if she was speaking. And actually, it almost comes from a direct interview that I did with my mother, sort of. <laughs> I was 24 years old and not married, and that was old for those times. I was working for a man as his housekeeper, and I worked hard, six and a half days a week. He gave me a couple of hours off on Sunday to go to Mass. It was a steady goal to keep up with the work. I hauled water five times a day and used an old flat iron heated up on the back of the stove. One Sunday after Mass, the old man told me to keep on my good dress and to wait a spell in the kitchen. So I sat down on the daybed with my hands folded in my lap and I waited. Before long, a man came in and he took a chair by the door, and him and the old man started talking about weather, fish, and old schooners of the bay. The young fellow never looked at me, and he never spoke a word to me either. Then he got up, and they shook hands and said goodbye. The old man said the young fellow's name was Bill, and he worked on the Labrador. He said he came home in the fall of the year to take care of his old aunt, who was going to leave the house when she died. He told me that this bill was dependable, he never drank, and he always paid up his accounts. I said to myself, well, it's all very well and good, but what's that got to do with me? Well, the exact same thing went on the next Sunday, and the Sunday after that. On the third Sunday, I tell you, I was in no mood to go sitting around like a bump on a log, listening to, two of, to the two of them, so... I don't know, I must have tapped my foot or cleared my throat real loud or something because Bill looked over at me and he said, would you like to go for a walk to the road with me? Well, in those days, you never went walking with a boy alone unless you were hooked up with him. Oh, it might be all right to run if you ran into a few fellas if you were out with a pack of girls. You might call out to one another. But I knew something was up when he asked me that. So anyway, we walked up around the church, and he never said a word. When I said, lovely weather, he kicked at a rock, gentle-like. Oh, he was never wrong. And you know, that kick seemed, kick seemed to be almost a word, almost a conversation. We were coming back down around when Harry O'Keefe came up from behind a shed and started walking alongside me. Bill moved in around the back of us, and he wedged in between myself and Harry. Move over, Harry, he said. She's my woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, Harry went on then, and Bill walked me home. When we got to the gate, he took a ring out of his pocket, and he put it on my finger. There you go, love, he said. We're engaged now. <laughs> <laughs> we get married in the fall when I get back from the Labrador. And then he put his hand in his pocket again, and he drew out an envelope, and he handed it to me. He said, there's a bit of money in there, and I'll buy yourself a nice suit and a hat to get married in. And that's what I did. <laughs> we got married the next fall, and we stayed married for 50 years. He was never much of a man for talking, but that suited me just fine. <laughs> And this is absolutely true. It's called Dad in the Bridge Box. My father never wanted anything. Everything was a fight in his head. He didn't want the telephone. He still doesn't know how to talk about it. He didn't want the television, but where is he every Friday night but plunked down in the parlor watching chair? He wouldn't miss it for mass. He definitely didn't want the refrigerator. He thought it was only a gadget to fill up space. Mom was fidgety the day it was due to arrive from town. She kept going to the door to look out and drying her hands on her apron when they weren't even wet. Where's your father now? She kept asking over her shoulder. In the shed, I kept saying. Well, finally it came and was landed on our doorstep. The men never brought it in, so Mom had to go out and get Dad to help us put it on one of the old throw mats and haul and push it into the kitchen. He was looking at it with a funny glint in his eye. Not a mad look, something else, I couldn't tell what it was. When we had it shoved into the corner back up against the wall, he kept saying, careful now, 
mind, mind. I thought to myself, she's just going to be good. <laughs> Mom started cutting at the cardboard box with the bread knife, bread knife when Dad said, no, no, let me get it. He was so careful, he took so long. He only cut the front of the box away. He wouldn't cut the sides or the top or the bottom. For God's sake, Bill Mom said. No, he said, I know what I meant. It was hard to get the fridge out because there was hardly any place to put our hands in order to grab hold of it. Finally, we had to haul and wedge it out by the open door of it. When we had it out, Dad backed down the hall with the box in tow. He never even looked at the fridge. <laughs> he took his chair out of its spot in the parlor and he put the fridge box in its place. <laughs> And then he got one of Mom's braided mats and he put it on the floor of the box and then he put his chair in the box. <laughs> and that's what he said every time he sat at the party. Mom said, Bill, you're not going to sit in that box. It's cozy, Dad said. It keeps the drafts off me. You see, my father was a man obsessed with keeping warm. He even used to put his tools in the oven at night so they'd be warm in the morning. <laughs> We'd say, Dad, your hammer's ready. <laughs> Dad, your saw is done. <laughs> Men would come to visit him as he sat in the box. They'd say, what's a dandy box you got there, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> no one ever paid much mind to him. Nobody thought it was odd. Because you see, that was a time when the old people used everything. <laughs> <laughs> It was nothing but pure joy to do all those plays out there. 
Yeah, that's what people told me. Yeah, yeah. I tried to write also, uh, you know, in a way after I sort of exhausted for myself the oral history, but of course it's, it's still not exhausted, just I wanted to try to write about different things. I wanted to write about social issues, things um, that I thought were affecting people, not just on Cape Shore, but everywhere. Uh, so I wrote about that too. Yeah. Anybody in here writing? You know, I really think that um, if you're interested in reading, and I think people who are interested in reading want to write, <laughs> so I always get that feeling. And I think people who, um, you know, like I always found my mother and father's, their lives, because of the time that they were born, that whole pre-Confederation, that whole isolation, all of that. I mean, they were both born in islands in the Bay, but even if they hadn't been, you know that there's so you know these stories that are that could be just folklore, whatever just folklore is. You know, I, it's such a precious thing. It's it's really quite rare, and sometimes you can write about that stuff, and it can be sentimental. But I think the more you read about how people write about their lives, the more you learn how to kind of get out of sentimentality and put it to something else. And that's something else I think is literature. So I find that fascinating. But I, there's nothing more interesting than our own lives. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think so. I bet you, every, you know, I bet you if I interviewed everybody in this room, there would be something that you would be able to to write your story. I have a feeling that I could get you to write your story. <laughs> yeah. No, I do believe that. I think everybody's life is so unique. A lot of people don't realize their own lives are interesting. That's right. That's right. There's a great title of a book uh, about uh, a very ordinary story. The title of the book is called uh, Just an Ordinary Life. And it seems like an ordinary life, but it's, it wasn't. Uh, it was about a woman who actually lived in Nazi Germany. It was a Jew. You know, she was a Jewish woman in Nazi Germany. She thought it was just ordinary because I mean, she looked around her and everybody was going into the into the camps and that. But so what makes that different? Well, oh my God, her story hadn't have come out. Then we would have known some more about that situation. But like I, I used to interview my, I used to drive my mother crazy actually because I used to say, so then what happened? You know, and and my mother had this incredible. Um, uh, you know, because she never, she always said she never got past the third book, which probably meant grade one or something even, you know. Uh, she was an incredible seamstress, she was an incredible businesswoman for running a house, she was an incredible cook, and she was kind of obsessed with her own life, you know. She wondered how come her life was this way, so she talked about it all the time. And whenever she'd start talking about it, I'd just run and get the tape recorder. Mm -hmm. And she'd say, this is, no, this is not interesting. Why are you doing this? It's not interesting at all. But, I mean, it's very interesting. There's no such thing as an ordinary life. So the history is not interesting until it's... That's not news anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, right. I have the newspapers. And it doesn't have to be all about the kings and the queens. I mean, we're all interested in Prince William and all that stuff, I suppose. You know? And it's in the tabloid. No, we're probably not. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's splashed at so much that we think we should be interested in it. But, you know, there's nothing more interesting in our lives. Getting at that. I sound like a preacher. <laughs> Write your story. Write your own story. Ron Hines. Said once when he was uh, interviewed about his uh, songwriting that you wrote about what's in your own backyard. Yeah, that's right. That's it. That's well, the famous yeah. French writer Voltaire said, Cultivate your own backyard. Yeah. Get to know that before you get to know the world. And I love traveling and, and going out around. But, um, there's something always draws me back. I think, too, we probably all have questions, you know, like, why did our mother do this or father do that? Or why did the grandmother do this? 
You know, and those are the things really worth investigating. And if you can't find out, make it up. <laughs> make it up. Go with what you got, make it up. I mean, that's what fiction is. I mean, you know, Michael Crummy has talked about it, Bernice Morgan. I mean, is it all true? I mean, did I really have, did me and my mother, which is that our border Alfred with me and my mother thought after my father died, maybe we should get a border. And, I mean, but he wasn't 300 pounds. But he kind of had this way about him. And <coughs> it, so, you know, you make things up and then you get a story and partially it's true. I mean, I'm sure that man wouldn't recognize himself except for the accordion play. He did say that line, I, I mean, just sat on the back doorstep and played out to the backyard and he said, I'm rusty and this is the first time in ages I've played for the public. And that's actually what got me going on that story. I thought, what a bizarre, bizarre statement. Playing for the public, I mean, that's just the backyard. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for coming out. So we'll see familiar faces, too. Old family faces that I've known all my life. That's great. You still writing, Sadie? I finished our, uh, our own family history a couple of years ago. Yeah. My father and your father were friends. Yeah, well, they were really good friends. Yeah, my dad and uh, I really had a lot in common. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if your father fished you up, did he? Uh, he did early on. But um, he, well, his father died, and his mother, they both died very young. And he took over his father's fishing school. But um, I think he sold it because I, my father was always a really small, kind of frail man. But he went up to Labrador and worked in the Wayman factories, and that was really hard work. So. And I didn't know anything about the fishery until I met uh, my Oh, yeah. Because it wasn't in my background. Oh, that's right. Because yeah, your father didn't fish. You no, know. my father didn't, even his father before him didn't. Yeah. And my mother's father was a luggage keeper. Oh, so okay. No, 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 Where to? In Notre Dame. Oh, okay. So, I mean, that's a terrible history. It's not written down in uh, the Oh, that would and be best. It was very difficult to get it now. You know, so many of the older people are gone. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Find the details. Like uh, for years, I didn't read the gates, like, rates of rock because I couldn't get beyond the first page. I get first page. Yeah. A couple of years ago, Beth gave me a copy of it, and I said probably into the second chapter, I said, "This is resettlement." Yeah. <laughs> 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 this is exactly what it was. Because of the drought, yeah. Yeah. that's what it was. They were migrants. And they were that's right. Uh, they were transported all over the place. Yeah, yeah. migrants yeah. everywhere they went. And yeah, we kind of hear you get to there. It's right. <laughs> but just like uh, once I got beyond that, uh, getting home and all that dust to me. Yeah. <laughs> 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 they literally wear me out. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Well, John's John Steinbeck is is that kind of a writer too? He's, he's yes, but good. you know it's. it's uh, once you know, there, there's such a connection between humanity from day one. Oh, yeah. And you don't believe it, you know. Yeah. But it keeps on going. We all go somewhere eventually. Yeah. That's and right. And he was staying in the same place for a long time. Yeah. It's, just, it's so fascinating to ask questions, you know. Like, I, I feel fortunate that I did. I really asked questions of my mother and my father and mm -hmm. old people. I was always really interested in older people. You know? And, um, and, and that was a generation that will, like I said before, never be again. So, but they took with them. But you know, I did do some work for the town of Placentia and got the archives on the go. There's a lot of good information in that archives. I interviewed some fabulous people, and to me, some of the richest work that I've ever done in my life was put those interviews with people. So, it, for if you're interested in writing at all, even if you don't have any family connection, just to go in and, and listen or read um, those interviews. Or, Pretty fascinating. And I always say, don't even throw out the bone on that, but you get something written on. Yeah. Keep your 
first Thursday and last Thursday, and however I get the dates mixed up, and last Thursday is uh, Steve Mills will be here on the 29th, and he will talk about the archaeological dates here, and then related to history going back to the days of the French and coming up to the 1800s. So we hope to see you all back at that time. We will now, we invite you to drop down and have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, and I don't mind promoting, come over and visit our house, and buy our books. Thank you very much.